All right, welcome everybody. Today is April 9th, 2021. Welcome to the Northwestern Connecticut Community College Moosecast podcast. I am the Director of Student Activities, Andrew Wetmore. I'm your special guest host today. Along with me are my fellow students, and uh, I always look at them as co-workers at this point because they do a lot of the heavy lifting on campus. We have Senators uh, Kaylee Numkowitz, uh, Charlotte Benson and Renee Restivo. All right, today's topics, we're going to be going through some weird events in history, as well as some very interesting origins of words and see where the conversation takes us. So with that, we will get started here. Uh, so one of my, I, I don't want to call it a favorite because people died during this. So it's really not you know, really not something I should say I love, but I find it fascinating. Uh, so back in 1919, okay, we're talking, uh, what, a year after the Titanic went down, okay, so a while ago. Uh, this is January, all right, it's time that, you know, shortly after the holiday season, people are cold, uh, but what do they used to make a lot back then besides booze? Molasses. All right, so we are in Boston, Massachusetts, a cast iron tank of 2.5 million gallons of molasses for they're going to make rum with, not candy, um, burst. It sent a wall of molasses that was 15 feet high, traveled about approximately, they estimated at 35 miles per hour through the streets of Boston. It destroyed buildings, it moved vehicles, and sadly, it drowned people and horses. 21 people died, 150 people were injured. Um, and the, the eyewitnesses said the people arriving to the hospital described them as toffee apples, which is just cruel. Um, it took weeks, because if I imagine, how do you clean that up? 2.5 million gallons. Um, it took weeks to clean up, and uh, the, it's kind of an almost like an urban legend now. Uh, but they said for years during hot summer days, they could, you could actually still smell uh, the molasses in that area of Boston because uh, so much of it had seeped into the, into the ground and in the streets. That, could you, I just I can't even fathom that. I can't even fathom that. Like, what do you do? You see a giant wall of molasses coming at you. Yeah, that's I what I would do. I would probably run and but yet again a hundred years later it would probably smell pretty damn good at this point <laughs> I mean it's so and so it, the, what caused the tank to burst is I guess there was, there was a sudden rise in the temperature uh, yes. the night before so it's January um, for all of you sciencey people obviously when things heat it expands um, and it it just couldn't hold but first of all how big is a cast iron tank that holds 2.5 million gallons of anything so i seen these big tanks that they use to make um fish sauce is it fish sauce mm -hmm. oh my goodness they're huge huge tanks so i can't even imagine having like a tidal wave of molasses going 35 miles an hour that's fast at that time i think that was probably faster than cars were going at that time Probably, and consider this, because it, it's molasses. There is a phrase that is literally as slow as molasses. Right. <laughs> and it traveled 35 miles an hour. Right, like what kind and of force? I, I, feel, I feel like such a horrible person because I feel like you shouldn't laugh. Obviously, 21 people died. A lot of people were injured, but it's a wall of molasses. Like this is, that's a terrible way to go, first of all. I mean, what is your gravestone going to read? Uh, you can't un outrun molasses. I mean, <laughs> I'm just, I, I, I can't. Did you can't. hear about uh, the Swiss, in Switzerland, one of their chocolate factories ended up having an explosion and it was like snowing chocolate in Switzerland. Yes, I did see that. And I thought that's probably the most Swiss, you know, Swiss thing I've ever heard. 
<laughs> is that it was yeah. that literally raining chocolate? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, I don't, are there any other of these kind of crazy um, food related accidents that you guys can think of, you know, outside of Willy Wonka? I wish chocolate waterfalls were real. <laughs> well, I mean, who doesn't really? Um, yeah, I, you know, I, you never want to see bad things happen. You know, this is you know, obviously there's always the potential of loss of life. Uh, the loss of property to some of these businesses can be catastrophic. Like, I don't think that molasses factory to make the rum probably recovered after losing all of that. Um, but there is something, you know, humorous I find when you see like a truck tip over and a bunch of chickens spill out and they're running all over. Um, yeah, you know, I always sit there and they see like people go out there and they're kind of like running around either chasing the animals or they're trying to pick up like the free food. Like, I just want to see someone dump like a giant dump truck of Twinkies on like the town on the town green and just see what happens Like, just observe people. Would you go for one? <laughs> who isn't like a Twinkie? Yeah. I'm telling you. So, all right, so that's, that's the first weird one. It's just that that's just a bizarre, bizarre thing. Um, and this second one is just kind of a, such a strange circumstance. Uh, did you guys know at one point, Pepsi, the beverage, Pepsi Cola, okay, had the sixth, six, number six largest military, military in the world. Wait, what? Exactly. So Pepsi back uh 1959 okay uh moscow the soviet union kind of starting to show its signs of fatigue it's crumbling right we're coming out of post-world war ii um the u.s is trying to find ways to combat socialism and, and communism and that way it's to try to convince the russians that capitalism is the way to go so what do they do they introduce Pepsi Cola to the Russians. Okay. However, at this time, right, was it what's the Russian currency? Was that the ruble back then? I'm trying to forget, I forget. But it, it's you know their their money is basically worthless. You can't they can't buy anything. It, it's just a disaster. So, but they they're now addicted to Pepsi Cola. So like that's all they want. So what they're doing is they actually traded and sold billions of dollars worth of submarines, warships, um, military equipment to Pepsi. Um, and also they traded vodka, <laughs> right? Because that's the one thing they can still make it was vodka all for soda. So a brief period of time, Pepsi was the ownership of all of these literal war machines, giant ships, submarines, tanks, and then they would take and, they would, and sell them for scrap and recycling. All right, because again, at this time, you know, post World War II, those you know people were collecting iron and steel that were supposed to get melted down into stuff to support the war effort. Um, so you you need a lot of these materials. So Pepsi was taking them, selling the ships for scrap. And and then you know shipping the soda over there, but at one period of time they had <laughs> six. Only five other countries in the whole world had more military equipment than Pepsi. What did they do with all of it? They they scrapped it. They they took it and they just sold it to scrapyards. So nice. then we're taking it. They melt it down and repurpose it. I never all knew for soda. That. All for soda. It's All so funny because, like, Russia is known for, like, getting rid of their guns and helicopters and <laughs> their warships and everything after the war. They, like, traded their stuff for Oh, we lost you there, Renee. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, so after the war, um, which... Is really kind of surprising because uh, you know World War II didn't come long after the First World War. Um, you know things were still incredibly unstable uh, throughout 
uh, Europe, the Middle East, even at that point, Northern Africa, you know, and then also to Russia's um, to the east, obviously Japan, um, Russia and China often had strange, uh, strained relations with um, Japan. Um, so for them to do this mass sell off of equipment uh, shows one kind of their desperation at that point. But ironically, it's not for humanitarian aid. No, it's it's for soda. It's for soda. I wonder how many of them have diabetes. <laughs> no. Did you see that uh, movie with yeah. Nicolas Cage? Um, I, you know which one I'm talking about, right? Where he they end up selling him guns. Like most of the guns that came to America were from Russia because of World War II. Yes, yes. Um, oh, the name of the movie is Escaping Me. But yes, he's an he's an arms dealer. Uh, oh, yes. and, oh, you know, um, oh, like Warlord or something. Warlord, yeah. yes. Or, yeah, uh, I, yeah, I Lord remember of that. War. Lord yeah, of War. Lord of yes, War. That's it. That's yeah, it. yeah. I I didn't see the whole movie, but I knew what you. See, this is where my nerdiness comes in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, arms arms dealing is a is a very profitable big industry, and um, you know, it's it's part of you know the global economy that people don't talk about. Um, it was often talked about how after well, during World War II, that's what pulled uh, you know the U.S. out of the depression was you know the the country paying private industry to you know, produce things in which then you have to hire people and uh, that plunged the country into debt. But eventually that's what took us out of it because then those factories and everything that were built were able to redesign and repurpose and begin to build other industrial goods. Um, so it's really, it, but the danger of the military industrial complex is something that Eisenhower warned of, which it's dangerous. You know, you keep feeding this machine and there's all this this weaponry and and uh, you know elements of potential destruction just kind of keep stockpiling, um, and it's uh, it's it, it can be a really scary thing. It can be a very scary thing. Yeah, absolutely. So, but yeah, I just yeah, Pepsi, go figure, <laughs> go figure. Um, and now you know it's kind of interesting as you look at a uh, Pepsi and Coke. So one of the you know the big um, crises that kind of pops up every once in a while and then goes away is, is around the world is access to to clean water and fresh water. And uh, companies such as Pepsi and Coke um, have actually purchased a lot of sources of fresh water uh, around the world. Um, so they're looking at things like climate change and impact and how they're going to protect their business down the future, which is, well, what is one thing everyone needs to live? water. So what are they doing? They're purchasing and buying up the property uh, that owns and, and harvests, uh, you know, the source of uh, what they're going to need to sell. So there's a um, different type of um, fighting over scarce resources. Um, it's not just selling soda for for metal anymore. But yeah, privatization of that are allowed, you know, like it's private instead of something we're doing together it's these companies that are doing it on their own and that's where i think the danger falls in even with the guns you know because those things are left up to private companies what what i yeah. think is crazy about with about pepsi with the water and the and the uh, climate change thing is they're pumping down sugar down everyone's throats but they're worried about you know that the temperature it makes no sense no, it, it actually makes perfect sense. Let me explain why. Okay. Um, so they're a corporation, right? Their job is to make money, right? Right now, the demand is for carbonated sugar water, right? Americans love it. People around the world love it. Okay, but what do you need to make soda? Water. Water. What's going to happen when, um, you know, different regions that have abundant supply of water potentially end up having less of a supply of water they're going to need water and who's going to have it because they own it well it's good that they're helping absolutely but at the same time pepsi is not good for anyone nope but they have shareholders so again they're yeah. looking at ways to protect their business um yeah. you know 
way down the line and in the future. Um, so if you own the means of the water and you're not, say, purchasing it from uh, your local municipal government or you're not having to build desalination plants, um, you know, to be able to try to use salt water somehow, uh, which is fairly costly and really expensive. Well, you know, you're you're helping protect your bottom line, which you know, as a corporation, that that's what they do. Uh, but you get into the concepts of corporate responsibility, and you know, this is not about um, you know using up renewable resources. This is about using up a resource that everyone needs. It's um, it's fascinating. It's it's interesting. Yeah, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. Yeah. Um, all right, so those are my two two things about history rec uh, that I found recently that I was just kind of like, all right, that's kind of crazy. Uh, so we can talk about a little bit about some origins of some words now. Um, so how many of you here are uh, familiar with Alice in Wonderland? Me. Haven't seen right, it. Yeah, I haven't right. seen it in a while. I haven't seen it, but so the 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 Mad Hatter. Right, Johnny Depp character. No. <laughs> uh, dear, dear God, yep, yeah, yes. Um, <laughs> so the the phrase "mad as a hatter," uh, which is where that that came from in Alice in Wonderland. Um, so that those origins uh, go back to uh, it didn't originate with Alice in Wonderland. It comes back from the 17th and 18th century. Um, it kind of started mostly in France, but then really the the concept and the term. Um, you know, comes into play in uh, right here in Connecticut, actually in my hometown of Danbury. Um, so they used mercury to use to cure um, uh, felt to make felt. So they use the mercury as a way to um, produce felt from animal pelts to make hats. Uh, Danbury is the hat capital of the world. All right, uh, at least it was at one point in time. Uh, something like 80 to 90 percent of all the hats in the world were made right here in Danbury, Connecticut. Um, that's what actually boosted um, and still has a footprint very much in the town or local high school or still the Danbury Hatters, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and all the hat factories are here. But so the reason people settled in Danbury is there was a really large beaver population. There's a lot of brooks and ponds um, and small lakes here. Um, and so they, they settled here because they knew they could trap the fur and sell them to make hats. Um, and that's why the the hatting industry is set up here, and, and a lot of little uh, micro industries that actually end up growing this entire region. Um, but mercury is what poisonous. Poisonous. I, I, did, I, I did not. I did not know that. Mercury is, I, is I, I, very poisonous. Go ahead, Charlotte. Um, at least I didn't know what, um, that the, um, that Dan, that Danbury was the hatting, or at least at the time it was, um, the hatting company of the world. I knew, um, I knew that like the Stratford, like not Stratford, Stafford Springs area was like no well known for like the building company. Cause I always heard about it through my grandmother. Yep. Um, but yeah. yeah. Ahead, it's funny because as soon as you started saying the story, I actually remembered why. Because I, I read about it. I look into a lot of origins of words myself. So as soon as you said it, I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. The mercury made them crazy. Not crazy, but it affected them from the poison. Well, you know, it, it did. So uh, so Danbury's slogan, um, less commonly used now, but um, was uh, we crown them all. Uh, because everyone that was the fashion of the time, uh, derbies, top hats, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the um, uh, the mercury, which um, you know, so it, that causes shyness, irritability, it causes mental cognitive issues, um, and people would have uh, most commonly it was tremors in their hands. Their hands would shake. Um, also, sometimes referred to as the Danbury shakes, um, and. It, obviously, that that's a problem. So, one of the big um, results of all of this uh, actually came um, a, a holiday in the city of Danbury was um, Hat Day, and Hat Day actually was a paid day off in the entire city of Danbury. All right, private industry, public industry, paid day off, and what it was is to celebrate uh, the unionization of those workers 
um, and through that union were to ban the use of mercury. Um, so it was actually a big, um, one of the first big union victories for um, safety um, and beginning of those standards to protect workers. Um, and you never know that th these things kind of happen right here in your backyard. Um, and probably my favorite story from some of the old timers that I know, uh, again, these factories were still working well into the, the mid um, 1900s and, and beyond. And then in the 80s, I suppose 60s, 70s and 80s, they slowly faded out really after Kennedy. Um, Kennedy's really not to blame because he was the first president to not wear a hat. But that style was just kind of going out. Um, but some people falsely attribute that to him. Uh, but my favorite story is they always knew what color was going to be the new in style color for hats because in the still river that flows through the center of Danbury, um, as kids, uh, they would go and they'd see what dyes were being flushed into the river and the river would be green or very dark blue. Um, and they'd say, oh, they're making blue hats today or oh, then no, next this season is going to be green. And um, yeah, so it's kind of kind of cool that these and you know, these things still kind of exist in many ways. Um, there is still mercury in the Still River, but it's not a danger to anyone. It's it's so far under so much sediment now. Um, you'd have to go in and dig it. Um, but yeah, all all of this uh, comes right out of uh, right out of Danbury. Um, other stupid trivia about that uh, related. So uh, Westcon, Western Connecticut State University, uh, is on White Street in Danbury. Uh, the White family owned the White family farm, uh, which was a really large flat piece of property, which is now located kind of towards the middle of downtown Danbury. Um, they ended up beginning to make hats and they're making so much money making hats is that they actually donated this parcel of land to the state for a school. Uh, which became the Danbury Normal School, uh, which then was the first Danbury High School, uh, then became um, the Danbury Teachers College, which then became Western Connecticut State University. Um, so you never, you, we probably wouldn't have uh, a state institution in college without the hatting industry. Go ahead, Kaylin. Uh, what year did this happen? What year was this? I missed that. Oh, that's going back to the, oh, when was the Danbury Normal School? I want to say it was like 1883 is sticking out in my mind. So what type of hats were they making in 1883? That's what I'm trying to so, imagine. So you are looking, I'm sorry, 1903 uh, is when the Danbury Normal School opened. Um, but so in the late 1800s, you're looking at uh, derbies and bowlers mostly. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of you, you would see the occasional top hat, um, but that, you know, those were produced here, um, but those were more more European. Um, yeah, a lot of these things were exported around the world. In fact, one of the reasons uh, Danbury has such a large Brazilian and Portuguese population, uh, Brazilian and Portuguese share what? Common language. Portuguese, right? They're a little bit different, now, but they yeah. share a language. Um, so when people in the U.S. stopped purchasing hats because they weren't as in style, uh, they became popular in Brazil. Um, and so what they did is they, they were shipping them and exporting them. And a lot of those people needed to have business representatives come and be here and, and help transact that business. And, and those people stayed. Uh, so it's really a phenomenal, positive story of how um, you know, American industry really grew and and started a really prop, uh, prosperous, um, you know, immigration population here in Danbury. Go ahead, Charlotte. Did you know that back in the 60s, a, a car salesman started the Junger Center School at the University of St. Joseph's in West Hartford? I did not. Now you know. <laughs> now you know. That's, that's and I cool. was, and I and I was lucky enough to be recommended to go there by one of the former professors at the University of St. Joseph's, and I've been grateful enough to be to be a part of the class of 20, 2019. Very nice. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, you know what I love. What makes me such a history nerd is 
there's a story behind everything. Um, and why are things named the way they are? Who are they named after? Um, and that's something about local history that you, everyone should know. Um, is that there's sometimes there's an interesting story and sometimes it's just, well, that's who lived there. Um, you know, there's several streets here in Danbury named after the original family that started and founded uh, building a house on that property. Um, I have not yet looked up the origins of Wetmore Avenue in Winstead, but obviously would be of interest for me. I'd like to think it was named after me. It wasn't. What are you going to do? And for those of you who don't know, that's the one of the roads that runs right aside uh, Greenwood's our building right where my office is. That's crazy. So, yeah. Um, so here's another another slide. I have to admit I'm I'm a I'm an encyclopedia of useless information when it comes to, to hatting and, and origins of Danbury and how it impacts that. But that's my home. That's what I love. Uh, and that's what I represented for a long time in public office. So I, I just love it. Um, so this is another one, the, the phrase uh, caught red handed. Right? You can hear that right in uh, old timey cartoons. Probably you don't hear it as much today. Does anyone know where that comes from? To be caught red handed. I can only imagine. I Okay, so this is kind of nuts and kind of gross. So it comes from, uh, it's actually English, from Old English law that says uh, uh, any person, uh, in order for any person to be punished for butchering an animal that was not his own, the only way that person can be convicted is if they were caught with the animal's blood on their hand. That wow. is horrible. <laughs> that is a horrible, horrible origin. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and it probably also now we're probably thinking, oh, God, that'd be so hard. But you remember back then we we're talking about old English and I don't know, it doesn't give a date how old this goes back to. But even if you're talking 17 into the 1800s, right? Hygiene was not a big deal, right? That like people bathe like once a year. And that's another thing we're going to talk about. Um, so washing hands and getting that off of your hands, um, not a thing, but, you know, when you kill someone else's animal without permission, you know, that's their livelihood, um, especially back then. That, that was a huge deal, but, oh, gross, right? Yeah, I can't even, I can't even. Yeah, that's gross. <laughs> oh, man. Well, <laughs> all right, so here's another interesting one. Uh, what does it mean to go the whole nine yards? I'm not talking the the movie with Bruce Willis and Matthew Perry. All right. Anyone know where that comes from? You got me there too. All right. So I don't know. <laughs> right. These are phrases that we use every day. Well, I shouldn't say every day, but they're commonly known phrases that you have no idea. So during World War II, fighter pilots were equi equipped with nine yards of ammunition in their plane. Right, so they'd roll out the bullets all in one big line. That's what they had in their plane. And so when they ran out um, of ammunition, that means that they had they had tried their best attempt, and you know they use all their ammo. They went the whole nine yards. Mm, wow. Right. Interesting. Also, I feel like nine yards sounds like a lot, but I feel like um, I would have wanted more. I feel like I would have wanted more. Um, this is also why I don't fly. You know, I'm good. I'm out. Um, this is another one that I, I thought was interesting. This one I did not know. Um, uh, to to break the ice, right? Ice breakers. Go ahead. Who wants to take a stab at it? You literally break ice. Yes. <laughs> so. Wait, I actually um, got that right. <laughs> yeah. All right, so um, you know we we use it now to talk about how to um, you know introduce yourself to someone, make things less awkward, how to start a friendship, um, and that's essentially what it was. Um, at some period in time, doesn't really give, uh, but when a sailing ship was going to come into port, right, and there was ice. Uh, in the harbor, you can't get to it, and that port or territory wanted those ships to come in for trade. They would actually literally send uh, their smaller ships out of the harbor to break up the ice so that that ship can come in and dock and offload their goods for trade. 
So it was a way to, so that they could look out, see what maybe what flags are on the ship, see what it is they might have, and then they'd say, yeah, let's let's meet them, let's let them come in. So they're literally breaking ice uh, to to communicate and did it as a gesture to show you know affiliation with another territory that's coming to to meet with them. I never <laughs> thought my literal. I, I never knew that. I, yeah, I think I mean, it's crazy how like situations like that that happened so long ago are in our lives every day, like you said, you know? Yeah, there, there's these, you know, almost hidden meanings that have um, yeah. phrases that have lived on for decades and decades and decades. Um, one phrase that I catch myself trying not to use because I didn't know for a long time the um, the meaning behind it was the rule of thumb. Does everyone know what that one is? Um, no. I've heard about it, but it's messed up. I, I, so, I, I've heard the phrase used before, by but never knew yep, what, sorry, what so. it actually meant. Yeah, so when there's a, a generally accepted, um, you know, belief on how something should be, uh, you say, well, the rule of thumb is, you know, you know, you use this many, you know, ounces of sugar for this much flour, and that's just generally what you, whatever it is, could be anything, right? Um, and so the rule of thumb, though, goes back to uh, when it was socially acceptable for a man to beat his wife so long as whatever he was hitting her with was not thicker than his thumb. Oh, geez. are you kidding me? I'm glad you know, I don't live back then. <laughs> I mean, I would know, have so been stoned. I know it. Like very <laughs> yes. few people really understand where some of these phrases come from. And, and that one is, I think, probably out of all of these, probably maybe the most widely used phrase. And it stems from socially acceptable domestic violence. <laughs> like that is so crazy. It's nuts. I, I mean, it, it's it's crazy. Um, uh, so, like, what could you even find to beat your wife with that's smaller than your thumb? Like, let's like, what are you, what are you even hitting her with? So, uh, I mean, Whip. so I I know. Um, someone I knew who grew up in a very traditional Irish Catholic family. He's older now. His grandmother used to use um, a, a cane, which was actually a really thick cane of like almost from like a, a oversized uh, like rose plant or thorn plant, which was long dried and was pretty, pretty thick. I would say maybe um, probably actually probably about the size of a thumb. All right, and uh, had thorns still in it. And when the kids got out of line, she'd whoosh, whack them. Boom. Um, go ahead, Kaylee. I just think it's crazy, like all the things that in history were acceptable that are just crazy now. You know, it, it makes you feel thankful for for not having to experience that. Yeah, you know, when I. I had an accident, as most of you know, a while back where I cut my thumb open and I had to get several stitches. And I just remember thinking as they're injecting me with the lidocaine, I said, thank God I live in the day of age of, <laughs> of you know, uh, painkillers and numbing agents. Yes, um, yes. I feel along, that one. Yeah, along, along the same line, uh, the phrase biting the bullet um, goes back to literally where they'd have you bite down uh, probably either uh, back then it's probably lead, um, you know, actually bite on the bullet. Lead is a soft metal, but still pretty hard as a way to tolerate the pain of whatever they're operating on you with. Oh, oh, oh no, thanks. I'm good. <laughs> Same. You yeah. know, I I also can relate to that because the other day I was thinking, I was actually having the conversation with my kids about how I'm an RH positive blood type. And I had to get a shot in my butt cheeks when I was pregnant with each one of them so that I wouldn't develop antibodies that would kill my babies. So if I was born before that was even found, I would have never been able to have kids. Like I would have gotten pregnant but my body would have killed my babies. And so I'm so grateful for that. Yeah. 
yeah, a lot of people don't don't understand that. Well, first of all, like I think we're all taught, uh, like in middle school, all right, if you have intercourse, uh, the, the female's going to get pregnant and you're all going to die of a terrible disease. Um, and, and not that I'm advocating for unsafe sex, but getting someone pregnant is actually far more difficult in many cases. And that is one of them. That was something that I didn't know. Uh, you know my, my wife and I uh, went through a long period of, of trying to have children. Um, fortunately, we have three now, but that was something that they tested for and was looking at was you know, blood type, because uh, your body in some cases will actually attack uh, the fetus thinking it's a foreign body and, and kill it. It's and we can we can do stuff about that now. Isn't that crazy? Right. Yeah. And I would have had missed that then, and I would have yeah. never known why, you know, and it, it would have just kept happening unless I would have just by chance happened to have a baby with the same blood type as mine. So, I mean, it really is eye opening, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's the medical medical science is just unbelievable. So, what are some? So, of your... I got one for you, uh, Andrew. Yeah, yes, please go ahead. <laughs> uh, do you guys know where "bury the hatchet" comes from? I do. Because I'm a nerd. I don't. Go ahead. I don't either. Well, it comes from back in the days with um Indian tribes when they used to be warring and they called a peace. They would bury their hatchet. To signify the end of the war between those two tribes. Wow, that's not good to know. Yep. Yeah. And they would also sometimes use it in if they're going to be negotiating and talking about things so that no one would, um, you wouldn't think anyone had a weapon on them. They literally bury them so no one had access to them. And then they dig them up. I don't I think know. They're supposed to keep it buried because it's supposed to signify that oh. they're burying, you know. I didn't know the, so the other part. Yeah, well, and, and similarly, uh, so why do we shake hands as a way of greeting people? I don't want to ever think about that. No. Yeah. So it goes back, um, and I don't know the exact if it's Greek or Roman. Um, but it was a way of signifying you put your hand out, right? Your palm is open. All right. So you're literally signifying that you you mean no malice. You don't have any weapons in your hands that can do something to someone. So by extending your hand out, you're showing that I have nothing in there. And the other person reciprocates to show good faith that you don't mean malice towards them. And that's still around. That's still a thing. Maybe not this year because of COVID, but you get the idea. I think language is such a complicated thing that we, sometimes we repeat the things that we hear without even realizing what we're saying. Yeah, yeah, you get the, you know, you understand the modern adaptation, but you don't always know what's behind it. Does anyone else have any other phrases that people use every day that maybe we don't know what they mean? I used to have a whole bunch of them because I did this one time with my kids and we looked up a whole bunch of stuff, but I can't think of any off the top of my head except for the bury the hatchet because it was so awesome to me. I was like, oh, that's so cool. I don't know any off the top of my head at the moment. So this, so this is have one you actually heard our, of, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead oh, have, you, have you heard of um, butter someone up? Yes. Yeah. Like to smooth, like to impress someone. Mm -hmm. This was um, a customary religious act in ancient India. The devout would throw butter balls at the statues of their gods to seek favor and forgiveness. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> Who doesn't love butter? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then you, and then so you think about, okay, so how did that come to the US? Um, up until recently, we did not have a very large. Uh, Indian population uh, in the states that we now do. Um, but anyone know their British history? Um, a little not, bit. Yeah, a little bit. India was a British colony. Yeah, that's not surprising. And who eventually then founded the origins of modern America? British. The Brits. So things were far more global than 
we think. You know, for a tiny little island, Britain sure had a lot of like embassies in different countries to keep those countries in check and under their rule. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, but it's just funny how these things um, cross culturally. I mean, we, we use it in a different context here, and I guarantee, and we use the phrase buttering things. I say that with my kids, and my dad is trying to butter me up. You know, for the longest time, I didn't know where that came from. Um, it's kind of crazy. Um, so here's another one, actually, that our um, our governor got um, a mild hot water for a couple of months back was the phrase 40 acres and a mule. Who here is familiar with that one? Uh, I I've feel heard. like a promise made to the blacks when they were freed and it was never fulfilled, right? Exactly. Yeah, many freed people um, believed, you know, so this was, uh, it was a wartime proclamation by uh, General Sherman, um, January 16th, 1865. So again, right towards the end of the Civil War. Um, was to a lot, you know, freed families a plot of land to start their own, um, and it was, you know, it was used as a tactic to um, try to get support of African American slaves to turn against their slave masters. Um, and that, uh, you know, they figured, well, if you know, we help free them and we make them this promise. Um, unfortunately, what what ended up really happening, uh, of course, obviously Lincoln is assassinated, right? Uh, Andrew Johnson takes over. Uh, Andrew Johnson does not have the same sort of feelings towards um, abolition as some of the other people did, and um, you know, and uh, and it never was was fulfilled. And um, you know, it's used today as um, something that's going to be a false promise. Um, but even just using it as an analogy is is really pretty atrocious when you think of what that was used for in, in a historical context. And I said, I know that our governor used it, but again, it's an example of a phrase. Yeah, I don't think our governor, you know, had any at all malice towards it. And he apologized. And you don't always know the meaning behind these things. Um, I guarantee coming up, you'll hear someone use the phrase rule of thumb and someone's going to say hey, you know that's that's really domestic violence that's not appropriate and they had no and they guarantee they probably had no clue behind it and it's so it funny so that that if i catch anybody saying that i'm definitely going to make them aware <laughs> yeah now you're going to be yeah. like listen <laughs> yeah so educate that's it so um language matters but Sometimes you gotta, you know, not everyone always understands. You take it as an opportunity to educate, um, you know, individuals on a phrase um, that maybe they don't know the meaning behind. And um, so rather than trying to hurt these individuals, you try to educate them and hope they, you know, they learn from that and then you move on. So that's my, those are my historical oddities and origin stories and messages for the day. Go ahead, Kaylee. I have one more. Have you yeah, heard go of, ahead. Have you heard of the phrase um, big wig? Yes. 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 Like an important person? Well, the origin is back in the 18th century. The most important political figures would wear the biggest wigs. <laughs> the, big, the big powdered wigs, man. We should bring those back, I think. We should. Like, I think I could rock one of those. I could see you wearing one. Yeah, when I was a an undergrad, um, I was also the, I was a chief justice for a period of time on our student government, and I often wanted a judge's robe and a powdered wig, but I was turned down on that. So. Oh well. Bummer. Yeah. Ultimately, I had, I also was like, ah, it probably doesn't bring the respect to it, and people might think I'm mocking it, but I really just wanted one of those awesome powdered wigs. But again, maybe, crazy traditions, crazy stuff. Maybe, for, maybe for Halloween this up this upcoming year, if if we do a contest, we could potentially do that. Oh, there we go. Love <laughs> it. All right, folks, that is 
Go ahead, Renee. I was just going to say, to go off of what Kaylee was saying, how like back in the days, you know, the most important people were the biggest wigs. The color of your hair also was determining the determination of your social status. So red hair was the lowest, blonde hair was the highest, and brunettes were like medium glass. Go ahead, Kaylee. Is that just like your natural color or the, the wigs that they would wear? Yeah, no, they would actually make the girls dye their hair. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, it's, it is fascinating um, what becomes cultural trends and are signs of status. I think that one of, damn, what was I just going to say? One of the things that I wanted to mention about, like, I'll remember, give me a second. <laughs> Have you guys ever heard of the book um, Homo Sapiens? Oh, yes. I love the book. That That's what really got me interested in history because it, it goes over like the origins of the human you know where did we come from so interesting mm -hmm. oh i remember so one of the popes you know how those statues you're talking about with the uh small genitalia mm -hmm. they ended up putting leaves over the statues because they were uh one of the popes was like this is not appropriate and they put leaves in the place they actually chiseled <laughs> off the peepees and then put the leaf there <laughs> Yeah, again, it, it all comes down to what does society at any given point in time in history uh, deem to be appropriate. Um, you know, nudity and bisexuality back in, you know, the Greek and Roman times was not uncommon until it was very uncommon. Until religion got involved. Yeah. yeah you know, I think so. I'm reading the Scarlet Letter. And that was, uh, I think she did that because she cheated. But I think also if you were, um, you know, like gay or bisexual, they would make you like label yourself. You know, you'd have to wear something to say really? that that's what you were. And that it was so cruel, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, it makes me wonder, like, why don't, why didn't these people, why weren't they just politically correct? Like if someone was like, are you Catholic or Christian? And, you know, they're, they want you to say Catholic. Why would you say Christian if they're going to chop your head off? You know what I mean? Or like, why, why say you're gay? It's, you know what I mean? Just lie. That's what I would do. I've thought about that myself, I always, right? I always it, wondered. Well, I feel like this. I feel like, so I'm the kind of person where like, if I was gay and I lived in those times, because I'm the kind of woman where you can't beat me up like I'm not okay with that <laughs> like how back in the days that was okay yeah, so yeah. there's certain things like I couldn't handle or stand for you know so I wouldn't want to have to lie about what I believe in or think is right because then you just it's kind of allowing it to happen and but like, it's, like one life, things, it's life or death though like these people but you're gonna die anyway so sometimes choosing the way that you die is also making a statement so even though it sucks that those people had to die to be true to themselves it allowed us to progress because mm -hmm. if they would have just keep lying then we would still be in that position you know what i mean sometimes yeah, it takes I, lives I, to be i see what you're saying i just um, oh, I, I i know i know that and i wouldn't die about it yeah, I, I know. I know. I, said the same thing. <laughs> I, I know in recent, like, I, I know in like somewhat recent history, because, um, the, I think there was a, um, senator named like Marvin Milkus, if I remember correctly, and he was trying to stand up for LGBT rights and all that because, and but I think because of his sexuality, he ended up being attacked. So, or like something along those lines. Yeah, you know, there's, you know, people at different points of history, um, obviously beliefs and psychology come into play and you can speculate. You're right, Kayla, like you'd be sit there and go, well, if you thought you're going to get killed for something, why would, why wouldn't you say that? And um, you, you do see, um, you know, there's a period of time, you know, it has to start somewhere where someone doesn't think that that's going to happen to them for having a different belief, right? 
Um, and then slowly that's how people begin to try to control people. You force them to do something, uh, believe a certain way, think a certain way. And it's all about control and power. Um, and some people are willing to, to die for a cause. And then some people, or, or they just slip up, they get caught. Um, you know, you could also make almost like the opposite argument today. We're far more accepting now than probably at any point in history. Um, generally, or at least in this country, not at any point in history, at least in the history of this country. Um, but yet still people choose to keep things to themselves and that's their prerogative. Um, but you suddenly you ask why it's because they're scared of the ramifications. Are they personally ashamed? Is it because what they were taught growing up? There, there's so many reasons. So many and reasons. If you look back at if you look back at history. Sorry, I'm getting but yeah, if you look back at history, there every king was able to choose what religion they wanted the people to believe in. So like they were probably used to always having to switch. Like, who's the king now? Okay, are we Catholic or are we Christian? You know, so yeah, yeah I just point, do you actually are you actually believing in what you, they're telling yeah. you to believe, <laughs> from, you know? That's true. <laughs> All right, I think that's going to wrap us up for today. Tons of interesting comments, context, yeah, everything. It's Friday. We're all sleepy. Hope everyone who listens to this has a phenomenal weekend. Enjoy. Thank you to my students for uh, asking me to guest host. We will be back next week with another exciting episode of Moosecast. And that's from all of us here in Winstead. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Okay, thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.